Now, sitting back and thinking about that, you might think, oh, yeah, you know, sometimes I'll notice people, at least in the old days, that it used to be a cigarette and a cup of coffee. Or when people drink alcohol, oftentimes they'll smoke. And it's well known that different compounds like alcohol and nicotine or caffeine and nicotine or certain behaviors and certain drugs can synergize to give bigger dopamine increases. And this is not terribly uncommon. There are a lot of people nowadays who, for instance, take pre-workout energy drinks. They'll drink a, I won't name names, but they'll drink uh, a canned energy drink or they'll drink a pre-workout and they'll try and get that big stimulation, that a stimulant effect for the dopamine, the norepinephrine, that family of molecules that works together to make you motivated. And then they'll also exercise to try and get even more of a dopaminergic experience out of that workout. Sometimes it's also to perform better as well, of course. But as we'll talk about in a few minutes, that aspect or that approach rather of trying to just get your dopamine as high as you possibly can in order to get the most out of an experience turns out to not be the best approach. And what you'll find as we talk about dopamine schedules is that layering together multiple things, substances and activities that lead to big increases in dopamine actually can create pretty severe issues with motivation and energy right after those experiences and even a couple days later. So I'm not saying that people shouldn't take the occasional pre-workout if that's your thing or drink a cup of coffee or two before working out now and again. Some people really enjoy that. I certainly do that every once in a while. But if you do it too often, what you'll find is that your capacity to release dopamine and your level of motivation and drive and energy overall will take a serious hit.